Thanks, Lionel. Uh, before we turn uh, to the Old Testament and today's lecture, I just want to uh, very briefly deal with a few questions uh, that, uh, that came up uh, as a result of yesterday's talk. Um, first one is, do you think that the propensity of Reformed evangelicals toward an under-realized eschatology, can understand why the person wrote this question down, uh, means that we're inadvertently hindering transformation in our lives and in our churches? Um, I think it's a good question. Um, I think ultimately God is committed to changing people and God is sovereign. So I wouldn't want to say that we are kind of hindering transformation. Ultimately, it's the work of God. But I also think that where we are not thinking of or aiming for something, it is, it is less likely to happen uh, from a human level. So I think that where we have kind of communities of faith where no one is expecting to change or to be changed, um, that, is, that is not a good or a God-honoring thing. A related question, um, where have you encountered a balanced expression or practice of the holistic, dualistic tension in ministry and personal discipleship um, in lots of places where the church is being what it should be, um, is the short answer. And none of us express this perfectly, but, but you see a balance when a church is both um, evangelistically focused, but also caring of all kinds of people. And there are lots of churches that, that express that. I think just the challenge for us is to be a church that's always reforming, that is always examining our practices. And in almost every area of life, we do tend to drift you know, between various extremes you know, and in evangelism and love, if you like. If we get, they're not polar opposites. Uh, very, in fact, they're, they're the same thing in a sense. But, but it is very easy to become so focused on mission that you kind of forget about the broken people who are getting left behind or to be so focused on the broken people that you're just you're caring for people rather than uh, showing them uh, the ultimate act of love by pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ through gospel proclamation. Um, a question, uh, so since Thursday I've been considering the three elements of your definition of change and trying to discern if there's an order to them or ordering of them. Uh, change in behavior, um, modified thinking choices, um, and reshaped character. Um, is there an order? Um, well, the, the order in the definition is just simply kind of looking more closely and looking more deeply. But the, the three actually can't be separated, you know, that that changed behavior is the result of better decisions, which ultimately flows from a change in character. You know, but those three things are related in a, in a complex sense, and it's very difficult simply to say that you know, one changes and then it flows on to the other and the next. Um, you don't need me to tell you we're deeply inconsistent beings. And I think if I've learned one thing, it's that the change process is um, unpredictable and not a smooth one. And it also, I think, flows slightly differently for all of us. And the last question, which, judging by the handwriting, looks suspiciously like Colin Buchanan, um, <laughs> does Moore rhyme with sewer? <laughs> and the answer is, if your name's Gary Miller, Peter Orr, or Paul Williamson, absolutely. <laughs> but if you're Australian, probably not. So um, with, with that, can a leopard change its spots? <laughs> Jeremiah 13, verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then also you can do good who are accustomed to do evil. A slightly uh, ironic comment in Jeremiah 13. But one of the fascinating questions for me about the Old Testament is whether or not there's any suggestion that anyone in the Old Testament actually experiences the kind of change we're talking about. But you could go further. Is it actually possible for anyone to change in the Old Testament? Now, of course, there are those who repent and come to faith uh, in Yahweh, um, you know, Rahab, Naaman, you know, one or two others. Uh, learning wisdom is at least held out as a possibility. But when it comes to the kind of ongoing moral transformation, the deep personal change that we were talking about yesterday, the text is strangely silent. I did spend a couple of fairly fruitless days uh, looking to see if there were any uh, discussions of transformation or personal change in the Old Testament that would make my life easier. Um, it was a wasted search. 
There are lots of discussions of the New Covenant passages, like Jeremiah 31, notably, but seldom is any comment made about the implications of life kind of after Jeremiah 31 for what that means for life before it. So, for example, Rolf Rentorf comments, for them, the Torah will no longer be a written one heard from the outside to which each individual must respond with a personal act of compliance, but God will put my law in their minds and on their hearts so that it will become a natural thing to live in accordance with this Torah, which means keeping the covenant. I'm saying, so what does that mean for everyone before that? He doesn't say anything. Um, Bruce Waltke, in uh, his excellent kind of stimulating Old Testament theology, writes, the Israel of God always depended on God for their salvation. For the regenerate heart, the covenant stipulations are a delight and a joy gladly accepted with great blessing, neither a galling bondage as they are to rebels, nor a source of killing frustration, a sword as they are to Jews and others who try to obtain God's favor by keeping them without the empowerment of God's spirit. Right. Yes, but what is, are you saying that people were regenerate before the gift of the spirit? Are you saying that people before could or couldn't keep the law? There's just no answer. It's let's just look to Jesus who will sort everything out. What can we say about the reality of life before the coming of the Lord Jesus and the instigation of the new covenant? Well, that's what's going to occupy us for most of our time in, in this lecture. <coughs> Like many people of my age, Old Testament character studies were the bet noir of my upbringing in church. I may not have known much about living for Jesus, but I certainly knew that I was supposed to be good. Like Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Samuel, David, Solomon, Daniel, and a cast of thousands. Now, I've got to say that this kind of uh, Bible teaching nurtured my incipient Phariseeism which flourished in the stuffy humidity of Northern Ireland Presbyterianism. Until finally, a refreshing, cool breeze of biblical theology blew into my world. Suddenly, to my great relief, it dawned on me that it's not about Abraham, it's not about being good, it's all about Jesus. Suddenly, the truth had set me free. I had drunk deep, refreshing drafts from the wells of one of Queensland's greatest sons, Graham Goldsworthy, and my thirst was, friend, was quenched. Never again would I dream of saying that God could use little people like me too. It suddenly became anathema to use the Potiphar narratives when addressing hormonally charged teenagers. Daniel may have been a man of prayer who daily prayed three times, but there's no way I was going to lay that kind of legalistic burden on anyone without first taking them back to Genesis 3 and forward to Revelation 22. <laughs> You know, when I was a child, I talked like a child and thought like a child, but now I am a biblical theological man, and every story starts with God's people in God's place under God's rule and ends with the assurance that God has done all things for us in Christ, followed only by a reminder to share the gospel and an opportunity to sign on the roster, which is being passed around just as we speak. No. But th th there is a slight problem with that. At a prima facie level, the wealth of detail which the Old Testament narratives supply about the actions and reactions of the motley crew which populate the Old Testament does actually seem to be significant at some level at least. The sheer space devoted to these, albeit selective life stories, would seem to demand some kind of theological payout. Could it be that we've slightly thrown the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to reading them? Perhaps the problem is that we learn the wrong lesson rather than there being no lesson at all. Revisiting many of the Old Testament narratives in the light of the question that we posed at the beginning of this lecture, so is it possible for anyone to change, I think opens up the possibility of reading the sections of the text which might legitimately be described as character studies as exposing and highlighting both the consistency of human sin and the inex inaccessibility of change under the arrangements of the Old Covenant. But does that actually hold up? Well, let's look at some case studies. Start with Noah. A pattern of even the most exemplary human beings failing to maintain their integrity is established as early as Genesis 9. 
Noah has been heralded in virtually unprecedented terms in Genesis 6, verse 9. He was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. He walked with God. Only the elusive Enoch is given comparable treatment in 522, but Noah's treble accolade outstrips even him. Quite clearly singled out by God as the new Adam who emerges from the ark in Genesis 9 to the newly reformed world to fulfill the commission that Adam so signally failed to carry out in 9 verse 1. Substantial hopes are pinned on Noah's progress in this brave new world. Despite Yahweh's reassurances that he will not repeat the reboot of creation of the previous chapters in 916, this new iteration of God's creative project quickly goes awry. The extremely brief account of 920 to 21 lays bare literally the extent of Noah's moral fragility. Noah began to be a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. The details of what happened next and why it was so serious are elusive. Um, if you're interested, uh, there's a JBL article in 2005 by Bergsma and, and Scott Hahn, Noah's Nakedness and the Curse on Canaan. Uh, but it's one of those papers which lays out all the possibilities and comes to the conclusion that we don't really know. But what is very clear is that this is a case of the pilgrims' regress rather than progress. The fact that other than cursing Canaan for his prurient actions, and the verb here does denote kind of prurient staring, not just accidentally kind of you know, walking in on your dad in the bathroom, um, and blessing Shem and his line in keeping with a constant concern in Genesis to identify the seed promised in 3.15, Noah does nothing else. He just dies. Now that means that the Noah narrative ends on a slightly sour and disappointing note. Despite his evident godliness and his choice by God as a second Adam, the account of his life ends under a moral cloud. As Calvin says, this is no slight occasion of offense, that Noah, the minister of salvation to men and the chief restorer of the world, should lie in his old age intoxicated in his house. Rather than the trajectory of Noah's life being one of growth and change, it slides downwards. This is actually quite a surprising pattern that we see over and over again in the Old Testament. Um, take Abraham. The contours of the conclusion of the Noah narrative are replayed at the start of the Abraham cycle. The intriguing obedience, kind of relatively unexplained obedience of Abraham in 12, 1 to 4, wrapped around the extravagant promises made by God in two, verses 2 and 3. His exemplary obedience is underlined in 12, verse 5. He took Sarah and his wife and Lot, his brother's sons, all the possessions they gathered and the people they'd acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And his obedience is matched by his piety as he responds to Yahweh's revelation to your offspring, I'll give this land by building an altar in 12 verse 7. However, no sooner has Abraham been introduced to us in glowing terms that his character is called into question. Whilst the narrative of 1210 to 20 is a matter of some dispute, it's hard to escape the implication that Abram is being selfish. The language of verses 11 to 13 at least implies some discomfort with Abram's actions. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife, I know that you're a woman beautiful in appearance. Uh, it's one of those lovely ESV-isms. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you're my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. Now, it is an enduring question I have, and one I really do want to ask Sarah if I get the opportunity in the new creation. And you went along with this because? <laughs> Abram's not even particularly subtle. No. Uh, could you do this so that it would go well with me? <laughs> Uh, which is then kind of illustrated by the fact that he ends up living a life of safety with sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels, you know, which I um, suggest weren't accumulated instantly. You know, it, it kind of takes a while to find room for these things. So it seems like Sarah spent more than an afternoon in, in Pharaoh's house. Now, James Hoffmeyer has argued persuasively that the concept behind Abram's scheme is uh, some kind of treaty marriage, which offers him formal protection. But it doesn't change the point. As Westerman puts it, Abraham does not think of divine intervention. Here he is not a man of faith. 
to make no mention of the fact that he's not really a marvelous husband either. Sarah is allocated a place in peril in Pharaoh's house, which appears to be Pharaoh's harem, particularly if a treaty marriage is in view. Uh, add to that, in verses 14 to 15, Sarah has simply become the woman and no longer his wife. It does imply this is not good. God's anger breaks out against Pharaoh in 12, 17 to 20, and the reader does have some sympathy with the Egyptian, as he quite reasonably asks Abraham to account for his dubious behavior. Now, theologically, this is an important moment in the narrative. As we're introduced to Abraham, the man of faith, it's very clear that he's not exemplary in any, in any global sense. God has graciously intervened in his life and made very great and precious promises to him, but it doesn't change the fact that by the ethical standards of almost any age, Abraham has been a complete rat bag. The, the events surrounding the conception of, of Ishmael in Genesis 16 further strengthen the idea that these stories are not constructed to ensure that Abraham is the hero of the story. Given the fact that Hagar is Egyptian, 16 verse 2, we're again dealing with a situation involving Egypt which imperils the fulfillment of both Genesis 3.15 and Genesis 12. This time, however, rather than Abram actively promoting his own welfare at the expense of Sarah, he acquiesces to Sarah's solution to her infertility. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. And Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abraham, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar and she conceived. Now what's interesting here, and this is a, a repeating note through the patriarchal nar narratives, that Abraham's passivity and compliance leads to uh, relatively easily avoidable domestic angst. Abraham refuses to take any responsibility for his own actions or the welfare of his concubine. Behold, your servant is in your power, do to, you as, do to her as you please which leads to Hagar fleeing to the desert. Now, it's somewhat surprisingly, Calvin's quick to exonerate Abraham here. He says the greatness of Abraham's humanity and modesty appears from his answer in verse 6. He does not quarrel with his wife, and though he has the best cause, yet he does not pertinaciously defend it for the sake of restoring peace. He does violence to his feelings, both as a husband and a father. He was thus calm and placid in be bearing the vehemence of his wife. It was great excellence to restrain his temper under an indignity so great. Now, much as I love the great John Calvin, I suspect that says more about Calvin than it does about the text. I think Waldke's much closer to what's happening. He says, like Eve, Sarah now shifts the blame, and like Adam, Abraham shrugs off responsibility. Read in the light of chapter 12 and chapters 20 and 25, as we'll see, this, this is part of the consistent picture painted of Abram's dealings with the women in his life. Now, these passages are interwoven with some of the high points of the Old Testament. You know, to state the obvious, the sordid tale of Genesis 16 comes hot in the heels of the stunning declarations of Genesis 15, where the doctrine of justification by faith alone begins to take shape. But I suspect this is far from an accident. Lest we start to admire Abraham in Genesis 15 too much, the details of his life in Genesis 16, for example, regularly remind us that he is made of the same sinful stuff as us. The Abimelech narrative in Genesis 20, while substantially different to Genesis 12, there's no conversation about the scheme this time. Abraham is not the immediate beneficiary, and God reveals himself directly to Abimelech. Um, it strengthens the impression that Abraham remains exactly the same throughout the narrative. The abbreviated account of 20 verse 2, Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister, and Abim Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah, again results in Sarah being pulled into a king's entourage. When God intervenes, ostensibly this time for the sake of Abimelech, he is quick to highlight Abraham's duplicity. What have you done to us? Um, then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, what have you done to us and how have I sinned against you that you've brought, me and, and brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. The fact that this was the plan that they'd adopted at every place to which we come, according to verse 13, does little or nothing to redeem our impression of Abraham, even though God uses him to bring restoration to Abimelech. 
Now, the theological implications of this kind of rhythm of repeated sinful actions are not often highlighted. Westerman points out that Abraham's lame excuse serves as a warm warning against an attitude that causes people to act out of fear that others are wicked. But is that really the point? You see, I think the character study here does not function as a moral example, but highlights the key theological conviction that even the best of us cannot overcome our deep-rooted sinfulness. It seems that Abraham is not such a saint as we might have concluded from earlier chapters, as Gordon Wenham comments. So the final piece of evidence uh, that part of the underlying message of the Abraham narratives is that even the best of us does not change and is therefore always incapable of the kind of consistent response to God's covenantal initiatives that they deserve and demand comes right at the end of his life. If you look with me at Genesis 25, verse 1, you find this little note. Abraham took another wife, whose name was Keturah, who bore him six sons. Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, but the sons of his con- to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the east country. Now, alongside the slightly troubling mention of concubines, plural, although it may simply mean Hag- Hagar and Keturah, there is a strong implication that the problematic behavior that we saw earlier in chapter 16 was actually not a one-off. He did it again. Calvin again says, this time, thus Abraham, having once transgressed the law of marriage, perhaps after the dispute disrespecting Hagar, did not desist from the practice of polygamy, nor did he find a better way of negotiating the consequences of his polygamy. He simply repeated the same thing that he'd done with Hagar and Ishmael. The placement of events which may well have happened earlier in Abraham's life have the effect of underlining the key strand of the story. Abraham is justified by faith as a man who still remained sinful and the trajectory of whose life was not upward on a moral scale. Uh, Also look at Jacob. Um, Interestingly, I think the figure of Jacob has historically been regarded as uh, by evangelicals as the poster child of radical transformation, largely because of the encounter at Peniel in Genesis 32. You may have heard this, uh, my generation kind of were brought up in this kind of stuff, that Jacob's limp, you know, was presented as a sign of physical humbling, which ensured that the latter part of his life was lived in faith, a faithful contrast to the opening episodes. However, both the text of Genesis 32 and 33 and the overall trajectory of the story seem to be pointing in a very different direction. From the moment we're introduced to him, Jacob is presented as a thoroughly unattractive character. When Esau returns home, tired and exhausted, he betrays his own lack of self-respect, a lack of respect for tradition and responsibility, but Jacob comes across as opportunistic and self-serving. As in 25 verse 31, he urges Esau, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Esau despised his birthright, but Jacob does not come out of this narrative well either. And the initial impression is confirmed in the famous narrative where Rebekah and Jacob collude to frustrate the failing Isaac's attempt to give his blessing to Esau. Jacob's part in the litany of deception can be traced through the direct speech ascribed to him. In 2711, his response to Rebecca's scheme is entirely self-interested. You know, behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my brother will fail me and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. When he goes to his father in 2719, there's no subtlety in his approach. He just lies. I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. When Isaac grows suspicious and asks, are you really my son Esau? Jacob says, I am. And by verse 36, we find ourselves sympathizing with the godless Esau as he asks, is he not rightly named Jacob, the twister? Jacob's inherent lack of trustworthiness is a continuing theme through the narrative. When God appears to him en route to his exile with Laban, the vow he makes sounds decidedly self-interested. 28 verse 20. 
Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I've set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all of that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Now, the fact that he doesn't really honor this vow until 35 verse 7, and even then it's a bit half-hearted, doesn't exactly inspire confidence in the patriarch. Just as the reader is drawn to sympathize with Esau, so Laban's deceit of Jacob is presented as his comeuppance. On discovering that he's been duped into taking Leah rather than Rachel for his wife in 29 verse 25, Jacob says to Laban, what is this you've done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? And the punchline almost gets a cheer as Laban says, it's not done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Now in the desperation and sad machinations that follow, as Leah and Rachel vie for preeminence, Jacob's passivity in the whole narrative echoes that of his father in dealing with Sarah and Hagar and goes far beyond it. Uh, it's the narrative where Leah and Rachel are trying to outdo each other by having more children, pulling in concubines you know, to, to multiply their team. No, they, are, they are buying Jacob with mandrakes to perform his kind of husbandly services. And what does Jacob do? Jacob just goes, yeah, okay. No, you're with Rachel tonight. I bought you with mandrakes. Yeah, okay, okay. And the patriarch does nothing throughout the entire narrative as his family kind of implodes whilst growing in front of his eyes. It is really terribly sad. Now, against this dark backdrop, you can understand why people have sought some signs of redemption in the events at Peniel in 32, 22 to 32. Now, there are lots of elusive details in the narrative, the identity of the man, the nature of the winning move in verse 25, um, when he kind of dislocates Jacob's hip, uh, the significance of the stranger's statement in verse 28. But the most intriguing bit is the refusal of the man to give his name and Jacob's statement in verse 30, for I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered. And compare that to the language he uses in 3221 of meeting Jacob, of meeting Esau. Now, up to verse 30, there's nothing in the narrative to suggest this is a theophanic encounter. The only clear reference in the passage to God comes from Jacob, who up to this point has hardly been the surest, surest theological guide in the book of Genesis. So he walks with a limp from here on, but does the change go any deeper? Well, the account of his angst-ridden reunion with his brother uh, doesn't actually suggest so. When they finally meet after all these years, an exchange of gifts is followed by the suggestion from Esau that they retire to his place. Jacob's response? To lie and go in the opposite direction. 33 verse 12. Let us journey on our way and I will go ahead of you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they are driven hard for one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant and I will lead on slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me and the pace of the children until I come to my Lord and see her. So Esau said, let me leave you with some of my people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Now, the significance of the events is clear. Peniel did not precipitate a deep personal transformation in Jacob. He's still the same lying schemer. Johnny Anderson comments, a thorough scrutiny of the text leaves the reader pondering precisely how much Jacob truly changes after Gen Genesis 32. In fact, his renaming in 3229 appears to do quite little to change his deceptive character as he unremittingly deceives Esau again in Genesis 33 in a number of ways, including ambiguously offering to return the blessing and reneging on his promise to follow Esau to Seir, but instead going to Succoth. It's also not insignificant that the narrative continues to employ the name Jacob well beyond his renaming in Genesis 32. Now, in the closing sections of the Jacob narrative, the focus shifts to his parenting, where he again appears to be a chip off the old block. When his daughter Dinah is violated, his initial reaction is too passive. 34 verse 5, Jacob heard that he defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with the livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. 
when his sons Simeon and Levi take matters into their own hands, his response is more to do with him than Dinah, let alone God. 34 verse 30, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you've brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? The lack of any response to the challenge of his sons, or apparently to Reuben sleeping with his father's concubine, Bilhah, in 3522, further highlight the issue which famously contributes to the breakdown of normal family relationships and the sale of Joseph into slavery in chapter 37. The fact that Israel that loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, where he, Jacob simply repeats the mistake of his own father, strengthens the case that it's very difficult to argue that Jacob changes at any level. The narrative of Jacob's return to Bethel, 35, 5 to 8, and God's final appearance to him, in which he both reiterates the name change of chapter 32 and gathers up the promises and commissioning given to Adam and Abraham. I am the God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation, and company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body, reminds us that as with Abraham, the details of Jacob's life are neither exemplary nor pointless but a crucial part of the writer's intention to set out the Old Testament contours of the gospel of grace. I touched on Moses on, on, on Thursday night. I think the trajectory of Moses' life is actually similar. I'll not go over the details again, um, but the, the statement in Numbers 12, you know, that Moses was the most meek man in all the earth, I think makes more sense if it's taken in the sense he was the most wed down man in all the earth as everything in Israel falls apart in uh, Numbers 11 to 14. Uh, but also when you trace Moses' beginnings as a slightly hot-headed, if well-intentioned man acting against the Egyptian taskmaster, uh, murdering, when he, murdering him when he is uh, abusing an Israelite, followed through to the Numbers incident, Numbers 25, when he takes matters into his own hands and picks up the staff and strikes the rock, uh, deliberately acting in the place of God and is so excluded from the land, also suggests that even the great Moses is not held up as a character example. It's often um, underestimated the impact of having Moses die outside the Promised Land at the end of, of Deuteronomy 34. Uh, personally, I think it's got to be just about the most brilliant and dramatic visual aid that a sermon ever had. As Moses preaches his heart out all the way through Deuteronomy and then gets to the end and says, I'm not going into the land, you know, and then dies. You know? I mean, it, it's just hard for us to actually get our heads around how worrying that would be. Imagine you're sitting on the grass in front of Moses. Moses has led the nation for 40 years. Uh, Moses, who I think is a literary genius, has just, you know, preached for the last time and told you that if you go into the land, if you are not very careful, you will forget the Lord your God and be thrown out of it. And then he himself dies before he gets in. I, I, can't believe anything other than those sitting listening to Moses, certainly if they had any spiritual sensitivity at all, at that point were extremely worried, thinking if Moses can't pull it off, how can we? So I think this trajectory continues. And it, it's often matched by immediate, immediately after great high points, great moments of grace in the Old Testament, a reminder often in the same chapter of the frailty of humanity and the sinfulness of those concerned. And I think that's quite deliberate. And that message is conveyed generally not by abstract theological statements, but by exposure to the sordid details of the life of the person concerned. And that's picked up in both David and Solomon. Whether the slightly disputed text of 1 Samuel 13, 14 and 16 verse 7 refer to God's choice or David's character, it's clear that at some level, David's godliness is affirmed from the outset of the narratives. You know, he is a man after you know, uh, God's own heart traditionally, or a man who is chosen you know, by God on his agenda. Because that is set, aside the, uh, set beside the Saul narratives, it's quite clearly differentiating David from Saul at the basic level of godliness. 
Now, in the books of Kings, David is held up repeatedly as the gold standard. 1 Kings 15.3 and 11, 2 Kings 14.3, 16.2. The kings of Judah are evaluated against David, who followed God wholeheartedly. Um, the only decent kings Judah ever had post-David, Hezekiah and Josiah, are those who are explicitly said to follow in their forefathers' steps. But the interesting thing with David is the trajectory of his life. David is one who starts off well, but actually appears to track downwards morally and spiritually as the years go on. After negotiating the testing and tricky reign of Saul and responding graciously in his death in 2 Samuel 1, the first sign that all is not well comes as David seeks to relocate the ark in Jerusalem. Seemingly ignorant of the prescriptions for ark transporting, uh, the ride on the cart and the slide off the cart ends in disaster as Uzzah is struck down. But for our purposes, what's striking is the statement in 6 verse 8 that David was angry because Yahweh had broken out against Uzzah. For the first time, God acts against David, compare 520, where God breaks out against the Philistines, and David does not respond well. It seems that power is starting to affect God's anointed one adversely. The note which opens 2 Samuel 11 is indicative of his slide into decadence. In the spring, of the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him, and they ravaged the Ammonites and so on, and David remained at Jerusalem. No, there is a substantial discussion stroke argument over whether this is a general statement about kingly martial habits or is a reference back to the previous chapter. Um, John Woodhouse discusses this at, at some length in his commentary on 2 Samuel. Now, I think on balance the arguments are slightly in favor of the traditional reading, but there's not much hangs on it because the emphasis on David sitting in Jerusalem at a loose end ultimately ensures that the same effect is created. His abuse of royal power in taking Bathsheba, the language echoes Genesis 3, 1 to 6, manipulating his loyal servant Uriah and eventually orchestrating his death flies in the face of what is required of one chosen by God. The events surrounding the census in 2 Samuel 24 are notoriously difficult to interpret, but in any reading of the text, David does not come out well. The context is that according to 24 verse 1, again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, which tells us from the outset that the text's verdict comes out negatively on David. God then uses or incites David to the foolish and faithless act of numbering Israel and Judah. God's motives are not declared here, but what is clear is that David himself thinks it's a marvelous idea, despite the uncharacteristic cautionary words of Joab in 24 verse 3. And I, I, I think from what we can glean of Joab's character, if Joab is the one telling you to pull back, you really should have listened. D disaster ensues. It's not spelled out in the text why, why numbering um, the people is so bad, but the clear implication is that David's hubris has been a material cause in the tragedy. It's hard to imagine David as a young man falling into this trap. The man of 1 Samuel 17 has changed. And the general drift is confirmed by the picture of David with which we're presented in the opening two chapters of the books of Kings. Um, I think the opening verses of the books of Kings are strangely one of my favorite openings of any book of the Bible because they're so utterly unexpected and slightly pathetic. David is a pale shadow of the man of action, both good and bad, that we met in the books of Samuel. The giant killer and Bathsheba seducer is now reduced to lying in bed with a beautiful young woman whose job it is simply to keep him warm. First Kings 1. King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore his servant said, Let a young woman be brought for my lord the king, and let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms that my, lo that my lord the king may be warm. So they sought for a beautiful young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful. Did we mention that she was beautiful? And she was of service to the king and attended to him, but the king knew her not. Now, you know, the writer of First and Second Kings has a fairly quirky and dark sense of humor. And at this point, he's actually saying that there is this beautiful young woman in bed with David of Bathsheba fame. And David 
doesn't have any interest in getting up to any mischief. It is not supposed to be a moral commendation. It's actually a picture of decline. Now, as you read on in that chapter, we find that Adonijah is mounting a, mounting a coup, and David's only concern is, I think, to ask uh, Abishag just to move over a little bit because my left foot's still cold. And Bathsheba and Nathan are saying, you know, excuse me, there's a rebellion going on outside. Adonijah's just, to, and he's going, no, no, that's not it. Other, other, other foot. It really is quite a job for them to rouse David to actually do something. It's further evidence that he's not ending well. And then they get him out of bed in chapter 2, but for a moment you glimpse the David of old as in a thoroughly Deuteronomic way he urges his son to pursue covenant faithfulness and godliness. However, his last words, recorded in 2.5-9, cannot be record, construed in such a positive way. He says, son, you really need to deal with a few problems that I left unfinished. Joab, my hitman, deal with Joab. Act, therefore, according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace, 2 verse 6. Shimei, who cursed him with a grievous curse, now, therefore, don't hold him guiltless, for you're a wise man. You'll know what you ought to do to him, and you shall bring his gray head down uh, with blood to Sheol, 2 verse 9. It's fair to say that even the great King David, the one who held fast to Yahweh, and unlike almost all those who followed, who held the line against idolatry, did not finish well. In fact, in David's case, rather than even reflecting kind of a consistent poorness, David, if anything, goes downhill. And that pattern, if anything, is more dramatically demonstrated in the life of Solomon, his son. The ambiguity of the wisdom of Solomon, and I think it's very important that the first mention of wisdom in the book of Kings comes in 1 Kings 2. Use your wisdom, kill Joab, kill Shimei. Okay? I think that casts an off miss shadow over the narratives to come, as does the note in 1 Kings 3, verse 1, that Solomon's first initiative as king is to marry Pharaoh's daughter and set her in the heart of Jerusalem. It is never a good idea to go down to Egypt in the Old Testament. And Solomon does it as soon as he comes to the throne. His equivocation when it comes to worship practices adds to the slightly murky background to his commendable request in Yahweh's generous grant of unparalleled wisdom. However, the fact that in 3.16, the first case in which his wisdom is exercised involves a baby born in a brothel to one of two prostitutes. Now, Solomon handles it marvelously, but it should not have been an issue in Israel. You see, this is the only case in which there could be genuine confusion over two babies in ancient Israel. The child should have been born in a family context. However, Solomon's deft solution is evidence of the fact that God has blessed him in the mess. Now, the basic tension in the Solomon narratives is preserved in 420 to 34, where the fact that the land finally knew peace, 424, and the people from all nations were, were blessed, my word, by his wisdom, and 434 is interwoven with the details of his extravagant lifestyle and his ominous penchant for large numbers of anti geronomic chariots and horses. The growing note of excess is amplified by the easily missed details of 7, 1 to 5 and 8, where it turns out that Solomon's own house is bigger than the temple. And alongside the temple, he provided a palace for his Egyptian princess. This theme is intensified further in 10, 14 to 29, creating the sense that Solomon is drifting further and further from his theological foundations. Not only does he excel all the kings of the earth in wisdom, but in riches in 10, verse 24. In 10, 26 to 29, the bellwether issue of chariots and horses occurs. Not only has he continued to amass them for himself, but he's actually facilitated a thriving import business from Egypt. Deuteronomy 17 seems like a distant memory. And by the conclusion of his life in chapter 11, there's no longer any doubt Solomon the wise has been a fool. See, I think it's clear to see that Solomon joins David, Moses, Abraham, Jacob, even Noah, as illustrating the fact that left to ourselves, even the best of us track downwards rather than upwards. Now, is that the full story of the Old Testament? Well, there, there are examples of real-time change. Rahab, Ruth, by implication, at least Naaman in 2 Kings 5. 
there are moments of humbling and repentance. You could argue that Judah has such a moment in Genesis 38, reflected in 44. Ahab repents. Manasseh repents. Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges that God is God and that he is not. Jonah is left open-ended. But apart from that humbling, there's really very little evidence in the Old Testament of real change or growth reflected in these narratives that deal with people's characters. On the contrary, the details of the lives of those who dominate the text simply gives us repeated and powerful evidence of the need for God to intervene. Now, so much for individuals. Having examined in some detail the narratives of some of these main characters in the Old Testament, and we could, we could supply more details, happy to, to answer questions um, if you think there's anyone that I've missed or there are any counterexamples. But, but there is also the material that deals with the state of a nation as the nation as a whole. Um, if the individual stories are designed to convey the brokenness of human nature and our need of transformation, then that is backed up by the fact that what is true of individuals is true of God's representative people of Israel and Judah, and therefore by extension of humanity as a whole. The fact that human nature is basically flawed is hardly a new insight. And rather than attempting to work through the whole Old Testament, I'll just point out three broad swathes of material that highlight in complementary ways the basic issue facing God's people and humanity. Uh, the first one is in the preaching of Moses. I've written elsewhere in some detail on how Moses' preaching in Deuteronomy exposes for the first time in a sustained way the, the issue that Israel's real problem is their nature and that despite his best efforts, ultimate, ultimately his preaching will have no effect. Israel will not change or obey an exile. Loss of land is really the only possible result. The cutting tone of Moses' preaching leads into the sweeping theological analysis of Deuteronomy 4, which culminates in the damning pronouncement of 426. Moses says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you'll soon utterly perish from the land that you're going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will utter be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you'll be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. Now, much of mo what Moses says in Deuteronomy is based on that essential conviction. So in 8 verse 11, he warns, take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and rules and statutes, which I command you today, lest when you've eaten and are full and have built good, house, built good houses and live in them. And when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the, bond, of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The outcome seems more and more likely. And as you read through Deuteronomy, the reason that the outcome is so likely is actually because of the hearts of the people. Moses says, like the nations the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you wouldn't obey the voice of the Lord. They're a stubborn, stiff-necked people. However, it is in chapters 27 to 34 that Moses' take on Israel's nature and prospects come to the fore. The significant disparity between the blessings and curses in 27 and 28, the asymmetry of the ritual on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, from which no blessings are actually pronounced, sets the tone. It's as if, you know, they do the curse, curses and Moses says, oh, we don't need to bother with the blessings, you, you'll, you'll not need them. You know? And he continues in 29 verse 4, but to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. The problem is that God has not changed you. The concluding statement of chapter 29, that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law, is best taken as pointing to chapter 30, which we read, where the possibility of future change is finally held out. The revealed things are what Dan Block calls the gospel according to Moses, Deuteronomy, and the secret things are how God will work these plans out to actually deliver on the new covenant in chapter 30. Moses' basic perspective is backed up by God's own stark statement in 31 verse 16. 
Behold, you're about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they're entering, and they will forsake me and break my covenant that I've made with them. The reason for this is spelled out at some length in Israel's national anthem in Deuteronomy 32. The song's damning indictment of Israel includes exposing them as a crooked and twisted generation, a fat and sleek animal who kicks out, 3215, a perverse generation, um, uh, 3220, and a nation devoid of counsel and without understanding. Now, there's little suggestion that this is a song that is to be sung once and then discarded because it doesn't apply although there isn't actually any record of Israel ever singing this song. Um, I think the lyrics are a little too depressing. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that Moses' de death happens outside the land ensures that the future looks bleak until God's people are transformed. So that's Moses. Then you've got the prophets. And as the prophets speak into the life of God's people, they use a variety of metaphors and images to characterize their relationship and behavior. Okay? What do they say? Well, they talk about Israel as the unfaithful wife. Israel, Isaiah briefly, Jeremiah more substantially, and then both Ezekiel and Hosea majorly characterize God's people as whores. Right? God is the husband who's lavished his covenant love on her, and she has responded by spurning him for other lovers, whether the false gods of the nations or simply her own lascivious desires. If you're interested in that, you should read Ray Ortland's uh, excellent little book that is, that is now called God's Unfaithful Wife in Biblical Theology. Um, I've got one of the, the early copies of the book in the NSBT series, which rejoices in the title of Whoredom, which proved too much for the American market. So subsequent editions, it's God's Unfaithful Wife in Biblical Theology. I'm holding on to mine you know, in the, the hope that one day its value will be inflated, you know, to, you know, <laughs> hundreds of dollars. I may have to keep it for a while, but uh, the, the second thing, the prophets talk about the deceitful heart. Uh, the main problem of humanity is located in the heart, the control center of the personality. It's clear from Isaiah 6, later picked up by Jesus, make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Now, Isaiah's main concern is with hypocrisy as Judah honors God with their lips while their hearts are far from him. Their hearts are busy with iniquity, 32.6. They're deluded, chapter 44, and stubborn and self-deceiving in 46 and 47 and deceitful. Jeremiah shares this loathing of hypocrisy, but generally speaks in terms of Israel stubbornly following their own evil hearts. However, as in Isaiah, her heart is doomed and stubborn and rebellious and deceitful, far from God. And the heart desperately needs the circumcision that Moses spoke about in Deuteronomy 10, 16 and 30, verse 6. And two, two statements in Jeremiah 17 sum up his deep concern. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond it is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. And then famously 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Ezekiel's concern is that Judah has a hard forehead and a stubborn heart, 3 verse 7. The problem for him is that their whoring heart has gone up after detestable things or alternatively that they have taken idols into their heart or their heart has gone after idols or they have set their heart on gain. Other prophets add their voices to this chorus. So Zechariah 7, 12. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of, the, that the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. See, there can be no disputing the fact that for the prophets, Israel's basic problem is a heart problem. Then, Thirdly, from the, for the prophets, they do de depict Israel at times as a stubborn animal, a stiff-necked beast of burden. Isaiah, the ox knows its owner, this is 1 verse 3, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people don't understand. Hosea 4, 6, like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? Zechariah 7, 11, but they refuse to pay attention and turn to stubborn shoulder and stop their ears that they may not hear. Now, the final piece of evidence 
uh, that can be adduced for the state of the nation comes from an unexpected place. I'd just like to point you to the final chapter of Nehemiah. After the rebuilding of the wall, the reading of the law, the establishment of the national covenant, and the wall dedication and provision for running the temple, everything looks well set at the start of Nehemiah 13. However, what happens next can only be described as a dramatic unraveling. Tobiah, his nemesis, is allowed to move into a temple unit, 13 verse 4. The Levites aren't being paid, 13 verse 10. The Sabbath is not being kept, 13 verse 15. And worst of all, Hebrew was being neglected. Just imagine, 13, 23 to 24. <laughs> Nehemiah is at his wit's end and gives us a marvelous paradigm for Christian leadership. Um, after some amateur removals, 13 verse 8, where he throws to buy his furniture out the window, uh, a lockout in 13, 19 to 20, uh, some swearing and hair pulling, uh, 13 verse 24, and some very short prayers, 13, 14, 22, and 31, his work is done. Years of toil, and all he can do is cry, remember me, O oh my God, for my good. All his efforts have amounted to essentially nothing because the people are not changed. So after he's thrown a few punches, he cries to God and asks God to do what Nehemiah can't. It's a prayer for God to change the recalcitrant hearts of his post-exilic people. Snitcher captures the message of this chapter brilliantly. In sum, the situation Nehemiah found in Jerusalem upon his return was terrible, and the account gives no reason to think things would improve. Just the opposite. Nehemiah's one-line prayers through this chapter give voice to a profound and difficult irony. The people are back, and it seems like they never left. The post-exilic remnant shares full continuity with their pre-exilic ancestors in terms of rebellion against God's will. Nehemiah harshly reproves the sinful remnant in the temple area in Jerusalem, even while he offers heavenward interjections that he might just as easily have prayed in exile. These exilic-style prayers repeatedly remind readers that in terms of reforming the people, the exile was not effective. The Ezra-Nehemiah narrative shows readers the constant need to repent and turn to God's will, but not to trust in temporary reforms. The real hope is the same as it always has been, to wait upon God to fulfill his word, even in the face of persistent sin. See, within the Old Testament then, whether we're speaking of individuals or nations, significant, lasting transformation remains elusive. So, what kind of change does the Old Testament promise, if it promises any? Well, I think it's been established that there's no real evidence that personal change is expected or promised in the short term, but it doesn't mean that the Old Testament is indifferent to the matter. In fact, the hope and longing for change is a vital part of the overall fabric of the Old Testament and a key building block of a robust biblical theology of any kind. Now, the subject of change in the Old Testament is massively neglected. Uh, one exception is John Goldengay's uh, three-volume Old Testament theology. Go Goldengay writes at some length about the transformation that God needed to and committed to bring about in the wake of Judah's exile in Babylon. Here's what Goldengay says. The nightmare involved Israel's faithfulness, faithlessness and the dis disastrous effect that had on its relationship with Yahweh and its life as a people. The vision, therefore, needs to involve the reestablishing of the relationship, and Yahweh promises to restore the marriage, be present to the people to heal their wounds. But the vision also needs to involve a change in Israel. And Yahweh thus also promises to win Israel back, to bring about moral renewal, to reaffirm and deepen the nature of the covenant relationship, not least through pardoning the wrongs of the past. Then, out of a heart of flesh that replaces the heart of stone, it will produce good fruit rather than rotten fruit." This prospect of future change is woven into the fabric of the text at almost every point of the Old Testament. And just in the last few minutes that we have, I want to point out the contours of this hope of transformation as it's mapped out. In the Pentateuch, no sooner have the events of Genesis 3, 1 to 6 unfolded than God makes clear his intention to provide some kind of solution for what has happened in Genesis 3, 15. The implication is that this must involve some kind of transformation in order that the terrible choice is not repeated. 
The curses of 314 to 19 reflect a profoundly changed situation for humanity. And although the means by which this reversal may be achieved are as yet unclear, it is clear that the reversal of curse will bring a profound change, and that is coming even from the beginning. We've already considered significant aspects of the patriarchal narratives and touched on the events of Moses' life, but these are all set in the context of God's grand plan to redeem a people for himself, which unfolds through Exodus, concluding with the glory of Yahweh descending on the newly built tabernacle. However, given the short but patchy record of the people of God in Exodus 32 to 34, for example, the enduring question is, how can a people like this live with a God like this? And that question can only ultimately be resolved through transformation. And I think that question is picked up by the central book of the Pentateuch Leviticus. Intriguingly, the first panel of sacrifices in Leviticus chapters 1 to 3 do not focus on atonement. When attention does turn to sacrifices, which are specifically for sin, so 4.13, the sin involved is accidental, specific, and dare I say it, pretty minor. Provision is made for some deliberate sin in 6.1 to 7, but one reaches the end of Leviticus 6 still wondering what difference these sacrifices can ultimately make. When the material on uncleanness is introduced to Leviticus in Leviticus 11 to 15, it further highlights the effects of the fall in humanity and underlines the need for a far-reaching solution. As Jeff Harper, another member of the Irish Brigade in Exile, who lectures in another place, has helpfully pointed out. Now, all this, in turn, may set up the Day of Atonement ritual in chapter 13 as both the ultimate repeatable sacrifice in the short term whilst highlighting the need for an appropriate sacrifice that actually achieves real atonement and enables real change in the long term. In bringing the Pentateuch to a close, as we've seen, Moses' final sermon in Deuteronomy highlights the fact that God's people need inner transformation. As we'll see tomorrow, he then urges them to live the beautiful life to which God has called them, which is sort of described in the rich tapestry of Deuteronomy 12 to 26, but it's very obvious by the time he finishes that the people don't have the wherewithal to pull this off. They need God to circumcise their hearts. Initially, in Deuteronomy 10, 16, Moses calls on God's people to do that themselves. But at the rhetorical climax of the book, which we read earlier, he announces that God himself will bring about this change. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Although the nature of this change has not been spelled out, it involves a renewed ability to live God's way, to love God with your heart, soul, and strength, and results in a restored relationship with God. Now, in one way, the wisdom literature is also predicated on the possibility of growth and change, as in learning wisdom. The trajectory anticipated in Proverbs is one from relative foolishness to wisdom. Proverbs 1 verse 5, let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. Proverbs 9, 9, give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he'll increase in learning. 22 verse 5 talks about uh, not listening to the fool lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a, sl in a snare. But the question remains at the end of Proverbs that can this wisdom actually be attained? And at the level of, kind of the overall message of the Old Testament, the example of Solomon throws uh, significant doubt on that. And I think we do need to read the book of Proverbs alongside 1 Kings 1 to 11 in particular. Many of the Psalms also echo this dubious uh, take on the wisdom project. The whole atmosphere of the Psalms is one of a vibrant, wholehearted, wholehearted piety, which remains tantalizingly out of reach for even the most devoted follower of Yahweh. Psalm 1 is a beautiful Psalm, but the question is, can anyone actually live up to this? As it sets up the example of the godly man, but the passing issue, the pressing issue from Psalm 2 onwards is whether or not any human being can actually live up to this. So, for example, Psalm 15, read in the light of 14.3, or 24, 36, and 51, 
and the ongoing puzzle of blamelessness in the psalm, where David, the innocent sufferer or the sinner, may be righteous, may be someone who follows the Lord wholeheartedly and does not fall into idolatry as the Messiah, but no one can fall into the mistake of thinking that David is sinless. David knows all too well that God asks of us a blameless life that avoids catastrophic sin, but the problem is we cannot pull this off. The Psalms anticipate that someone, the Messiah, will come, and we could call him New Covenant Man, who will not only live this life, but enable us to walk in these steps. And there is a part of the Old Testament, um, however, where change increasingly comes into view, where it's preached and expected and even longed for, and that is uh, the latter prophets. Isaiah's radical vision of a transformed future describes the effects of God's great inter intervention at the level of God's people and ultimately the whole cosmos. So Isaiah 2.2, 2, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be lifted above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Now, rather than focusing on the inner transformation which ultimately drives change, Isaiah paints a grand vision of a renewed world. But it's a vision which everyone knows will require actual change in the minds of the nations and the people. God's intervention in the future, according to Isaiah, will make a real-time difference in the lives of people like us. Isaiah 40, verse 29, he gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. 51, verse 7, listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revi revilings. Jeremiah explicitly picks up and develops Moses' new covenant circumcised heart vision and fills it out for us. Deuteronomy 20, uh, Jeremiah 24, verse 7, I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. You can see also chapter 31, 32. And in David Peterson's excellent Transformed by God, David characterizes the newness of this covenant under the broad headings of renewed in heart, new knowledge of God, definitive forgiveness which then produces a new unity in the fear of God. This is a significant transformation. Ezekiel adds his own priestly spin to the promised heart transformation, underlining that God's future intervention will bring forgiveness, moral purity, and compassion, as well as the ability to obey. The vision of the Valley of Dry Bones articulates a future hope which amounts to a new creation in which the people of the Messiah will live under his rule. So see Ezekiel 11, 36, and 37. Ezekiel's vision of change is very similar to Jeremiah, seeming to draw on a similar stock of theological ideas from Deuteronomy, but recasting them in his own language and coloring them with a vaguely priestly hue. It's also worth noting that his staggering vision of the new temple and the new people of God who worship there once again implies that God will act to change his people in the new, uh, new age. Joel ha adds his little bit, in Joel 2, 28 to 32. And it's clear by the time you get to the end of the prophetic literature that the prophetic vision of change is not always well defined, nor carefully constructed, but there is a clear expectation that God will act to change individuals, to change his people, and ultimately to change the entire cosmos. But having worked through the Old Testament, I think it's quite clear that when it comes to change or transformation, while it is necessary and deeply desirable, it is elusive until the dramatic intervention of God promised in multiple places and construed in various ways is set up by the coming Messiah. I think there is no real change in the Old Testament. 
people are justified by faith in the one to come. God intervenes in real time, but there is an absence of any moral transformation, of any uh, expectation held out to people like us before the Lord Jesus that they will be changed. For that, we must wait to the New Testament and to tomorrow. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Loving Father, we uh, do thank you for the richness of your word. We pray you'd help us to think well. We pray you'd help us to read what you've given us wisely and sensitively and faithfully. We pray that as we read these narratives, we will see both the depth of human sinfulness and the unmatched power and beauty and generosity and kindness of you, our God, displayed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you help us to see ourselves in Christ more clearly as a result of working through the Old Testament even this morning. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Gary, for taking us through uh, the entire Old Testament and looking at so many uh, rich uh, and significant passages uh, for us as we look at the uh, question of change. We now have time for some questions. Uh, and the way that it will work is I ask you, uh, when you have a question, to raise your hand. Uh, I'll wait for the, uh, I'll, I'll indicate. And if you wait for the roving microphone to ask your questions. Very simple ground rules. We're looking for questions, not comments. And please keep your questions concise and refrain from long introductions to allow for as many questions as possible. Uh, I'm actually going to exercise my prerogative as MC and ask and kick us off with an annoying New Testament question. Um, it's about Abraham. So thank you, Gary. You took us through most chapters in the Abraham narrative. And you helpfully highlighted uh, Abraham's morally dubious behavior. Uh, but you didn't mention the climactic Genesis 22, the, the Akedah, where Abraham is willing to give up his son that he's been seeking to achieve over his life. When James reads a narrative, he focuses on Genesis 22. Yep. He seems to be taking Abraham as a moral example. James says Abraham's faith was completed by his works. Uh, and it seems to imply an ultimate trajectory of transformation, exemplary transformation in Abraham's life. What do you understand James to be saying here? Um, I, think, I think the danger of doing what I did this morning is you, you end up having to leave out some things. I did try to say there are, there are lots of things that the patriarchs, any of these characters do, that, that are commendable and that are exemplary. But, but I think that's not to say, looking at someone who is justified by faith and expresses their faith as, as one should in acts of love or commitment or obedience, saying that they are exemplary as a kind of sinner justified by faith is not the same thing as saying in the narrative, their character is transformed. So I think James is saying, you know, God was at work in Abraham, obviously, that Abraham is someone who had faith in God and expressed that faith. But I would argue that the fact that the narrative in Genesis 25 even ends the way it does, saying even after Genesis 22, while well, Abraham still, you know, he took extra concubines, repeated the mistake of earlier, is I do think that the writer of Genesis is trying to say, I am not holding up Abraham as a moral example whose behavior was on the up. He is someone who trusted God and acted in line with that, but didn't manage to do it consistently like any of us. Back. <laughs> um, Gary, thank you very much for taking time to prepare and come down and speak to us. Um, I agree with your conclusion, um, but I have a question about whether uh, there is another character of change which you may not have addressed. Um, in Jeremiah 35, we meet the Rechabites who have been commanded to live a certain way. And while the verb change isn't there, I believe it's a fair logical conclusion 
that we see lasting change in their lives. In Jonah 3, the people of Nineveh re uh, repent, and we see the verb shuv there. So how does your thesis account for the suggestion that there may be long, uh, there may be um, positive transformation in the Old Testament, but is used as a juxtapositional device to further exemplify the hardness of Israel's heart in the face of the Sinaitic and Transjordan covenants? Yep. Um, so the the how would you? Sorry, I'll, just the, I think the Ninevites repent. You know, there are people who repent and come back to God. But it's interesting in the Jonah narrative, the Ninevites. Like it, it's not about the Ninevites. You know, the book is about Jonah, not the Ninevites, which is slightly infuriating. You know, because even you have this extravagant returning to God, and you really, I would really like to know. You know, did. Was there, a, was there a little period where the Assyrians started being nice to everyone? You know, they came back to God. That's all we get, you know? So it seems to be describing kind of what, you know, conversion language, if you like to use an anachronistic term. The, the, the nature of the change of the Rechabites, how would you, how would you understand that? Um, I think it would be fair to say at one point in time they perhaps did drink or they perhaps were a bit more... Uh, they were more solidified in where they lived, perhaps. Yeah. And so since being commanded by their father to live a certain way, they yeah. haven't done that anymore. Yeah. And Jeremiah holds them up and says, they actually listen to their forefathers. You have not. Um, so, yeah, it's dubious. I get that, <laughs> absolutely. But, yeah, just, yeah, I comment on that. Yeah. I suppose it depends whether or not you understand the Rechabites change to be a positive or a negative thing. So. No. Yeah, I think, you know, again, I, that, that's when we get tomorrow, one of the things that I think we'll see in the New Testament is when the New Testament talks about transformation, it, it is this massive, complex thing that touches every part of our being. You know, so I think, you know, I'm not, of course, there were people who, you know, were doing bad stuff and stopped or, you know, suddenly started to do something better or had a good Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You know, I think what I'm arguing is that when you get to the New Testament, you see an expectation of God actually at work in our lives, making a, a tangible difference across a whole realm of areas where the New Testament writers are pulling in all kinds of pictures and metaphors to describe this. In the Old Testament, we are, I think we are actually scraping around, you know, to, to look for the Rechabites and you know, who just appear in, Je in Jeremiah 35 and then disappear again. I think even the fact that we're having to kind of look around the edges for these examples does sort of highlight that that's not the trajectory of most of the text. No. But thank you. Hi, Gary. Um, just another case study, if you could consider it. Um, Joseph, yeah. just thinking about um, how he goes from kind of being an arrogant daddy's boy to being... Uh, someone who uh, like l cares for and provides for his family, uh, as well as someone who seems to go from wanting to honour himself to actually rightly honouring God for the way that God kind of provides through his story. This yeah, that seems like transformation in kind of my, I know, kids' church upbringing, but... Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't an altogether bad thing, let me say. <laughs> um, I think... I think it's, you know, you can argue about Joseph, you know, there was, I think I referred to Joseph as a brat on Thursday night and someone was a little, thought I was being a little unfair, but I think he was a brat um, <laughs> in the, the early chapters. But I think what's interesting in the Joseph narrative, one, one of the puzzling things about Joseph is, is that the narrative's so long, you know, and it's, it's when, you know, every time I go back to it, I think, oh, hang on, you know, there are, there are five chapters or something of comings and goings messing around with the brothers. And I think, what is that doing there? And I think if it were a story of moral transformation, there's a sense in which that's where I, you'd expect to see it. You know, that I would have, if, if this, I know it's an argument from silence at one level, but if, if the, narr the point of the narrative were actually the transformation of Joseph, surely what would have happened is when he recognized the brothers, he would have, you know, stripped off his makeup and his, you know, headdress, whatever he was wearing, <laughs> and went, hey guys, it's me, you know? But it's okay, I, I've got over it, you know, come get dad, I'll keep you safe. But what happens is all the messing around, and Joseph deliberately hides his face from them. 
And I think normally, you know, the traditional explanation of that is, oh, Joseph is testing to see, testing them to see if they've changed. But it doesn't say that anywhere in the text, I don't think. But I think what it does imply is that Joseph is making up his mind what to do with them. And, and I don't think it's accidental that when you get to chapter 50, when Jacob dies, the brothers are in, are in a panic because they say, he, he, what if, I think he might kill us now that dad's gone. Now, that, that doesn't suggest that there has been this, you know, beautiful reconciliation and they're all really happy and they've dealt with it and put it to bed. You know, and even that, like Joseph says, no, because I have actually realized that God's promise is what matters. But the fact that for the, you know, I think the irony at the end of the book is, you know, for the last, Joseph is the one whose job it is to preserve the line of Judah. But I think the tension in, from, Deuteron from Joseph, uh, Genesis kind of 42, 43, is actually you have another situation where, where one, of the, one of the family of God could actually be the one who ends the line of the Messiah by taking vengeance on his brothers. And I think that's the issue. I don't think Joseph's actual character is, is particularly important. I mean, he don't, you know, Joseph, Joseph is immensely patient in you know, the early chapters in prison. But it's interesting, I think, in the latter part of the narrative, it's not focusing on his character at all. It's about the preservation of the line of seed and whether or not Joseph is going to kill Judah, to put it bluntly. But, no, but it's, a good, it's a good question. But, yeah. Yeah, thanks. I have a comment or two, and I'll see if Lionel can form a question out of this. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I take it that character development is a fairly modern uh, literary development, a narrative technique that arose maybe in the last couple hundred years since the rise of the modern novel. And much of what you've been looking at is narrative, and you're saying it doesn't have this feature. I wouldn't expect it to be there. And when you do talk about uh, some New Testament change, I think that's pretty predominantly in non-narrative material. And so I wonder if you can talk about the relationship between character development and progressive sanctification. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not an expert on character development in, in, uh, in literature, but I think I would I think I would question the fact that I think there is there is significant character development in the in the Old Testament. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's accidental. You know, I don't think, you know, the position, even the shaping of the narrative, um, even at points where where events are taken out taken out of sequence, I think it's very hard to see any reason for the narrative having the shape it does, unless it were to say something specific about the character and about the character with respect to God in particular. You know, that God ultimately is the hero of these narratives. And the, the presentation and the repeated presentation of the failings of, um, the failings of individual characters. I mean, you think of the Abraham narrative. You know, the, the, the repetition of the, inc you know, the Abimelech incident and the Pharaoh incident involving, involving Sarah. It's very hard to see why, why on earth would they be, A, in the Bible, be in the Bible twice, and in the Bible at the position that they are, if it were not to say something about Abraham the individual and his role in the overarching work of God. But I think that's a, I think it's a fascinating question. I'd like to think more about it, but I, I'm not sure what you do with the, with the, the narratives in Genesis, for example, if if you're saying that, well, there can't be character development because it only emerged and you know the, with the, the rise of the modern novel. So. Uh, Gary, uh, over here. <laughs> uh, I noticed that in your answer to Lionel's question, you said that God was at work in Abraham. I wonder if you could elucidate on that. I think you, if I've heard you correctly, you want to segregate that from the notion of regeneration and that kind of thing, transformation. Could you explain that a little further and what you mean by God was at work in Abraham? Um, I, I think it's, it's clear that God gave Abraham the gift of faith um, and was justifying Abraham ahead of time through the work of Christ. 
I think it's very difficult when it comes to, th this is where theologically, I, I think there's a tension between what I want to say theologically and the way in which the text describes this. You know, because you take something like regeneration. Um, theologically, you know, I say, well, the only way we can come to faith is if we are regenerated. And yet, that's not the language that the Old Testament uses. And there is a tension that the fact that the Spirit is given, you know, that the Spirit is not given until kind of Pentecost. So what do you do with people before Christ who are clearly believers and part of the people of God and show evidences of faith? So I, I really, that, that for me is an enduring puzzle. And um, what do you think? <laughs> 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 Should have just said that at the start, George. <laughs> Hi, Gary. Um, I think uh, really helpful today, and I think I agree, kind of in broad terms, that this is definitely what the Old Testament is kind of pointing to. I'm just wondering, there's a lot of detail. Is lack of change the only thing character studies are producing? Like, I'm just wary of re reducing the Old Testament to just saying this. Or what are the other kinds of things that the character studies are trying to get across? Or is it just no change? Let's look at the next one. No change. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Lest I be guilty of just trying to say that the Bible was actually written to support these lectures, um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which may be true, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would not be hubris to say that out loud. <laughs> No, I, I do. Th I think the character. I think the welter of detail that we have is actually there to put to put human sinfulness on display and to show that uh, that our only hope is to put our faith in the God who reveals Himself. Okay. So I think, you know, it, I would kind of argue that that the focus of that it's it's not just to show there's no change. The narratives reflect the same basic theological structure that we see all through the scriptures. You know, which however you sum it up, you know that people like us can be reconciled to, to, to God because he provides a way to deal with sin and so on. Um, I, I think that's the dominant thing. You know, I, I would never want to say there are details in the narrative that, that just kind of self-evidently carry a certain, a certain lesson. You know, I joked earlier about Joseph and Potiphar's wife, you know, but, but the narrative with Joseph and Potiphar's wife, you know, it, it does imply that sleeping with your boss's wife is not a good thing. And if you're ever in that situation, there are worse things you can do than just run out the door. You know, but but that's, that's almost, it's not accidental. That's part of the fabric of the story, which conveys some message. But when you pull out, you know, the, 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 narrative, the, the narrative arc as a whole is dealing with the sinfulness of human beings and the grace of God as he reveals himself to individuals and a people. Okay. So, yeah. Yes, we have time for one more question. Yeah. Hey, Gary. Um, what do you do with the spirit of the Lord comes upon so-and-so and some kind of change happens? Would you go like it's some kind of power or prophecy or something, but in the New Testament it's uh, moral? Uh, yeah, the, the short answer is it's generally functional. Um, and, you know, if you, if you look at judges, you know, Sam, Samson is the, the easy one to go to. You know, the, the spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson and, you know, makes him fairly handy with whatever happens to be lying around to <laughs> kill people, to kill people with. I think you'd be hard pressed to say that there is much moral you know, improvement in Samson's life. You know, even his prayer at the, you know, at the very end of the, at the end of the book is hardly the high point of biblical piety, you know? Kind of give me revenge for the fact that they poked my eyes out by letting, letting me bring down the building. You know, it, so I think the spirit seems to be, it is tied to function and to, in a cert, to a certain extent to office, but there's almost a disinterest in the, the character, you know, the, the character or the, you know, personal transformation. It's, it's just not on the, doesn't seem to be in view at all. 
Thank you very much, Gary.